in California, if you're 42 years old or younger, you can freeze eggs. You might meet someone later and decide you want to conceive children or use a donor. After 42, I think it's at 42 and a half, you can only create embryos and freeze those. They're just not, the eggs are, on average, are just too aged out. Mm. Males, if you want to be a sperm donor, you know, ideally you're, you're going to do that before 45. A sperm donor, or you might want to do IVF someday. Now, there is a significant increase in the incidence of autism with each half decade for the father, you know, so as you go from, you know, 30 or 35 to 40, the sperm age matters, but the increase is still incredibly small overall. Mm -hmm. So it's not something you can really point to and say, oh, it's the sperm, you know, Mm -hmm. or or it's the egg for that matter. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now do's and don'ts. We can now easily look back to the beginning of our discussion. It's very clear that quality sleep on a regular basis, sunlight, keeping stress in check, healthy relationships, all of that is going to support sperm health and egg health. No question about that. It's also clear that getting sufficient omega-3 fatty acids is going to support sperm health and egg health. I'll just point out that if there were one supplement that really seems to move the needle in terms of egg quality, which is a morphological, but also a a meaningful physiological metric or, and sperm quality, which is going to be shape motility. You don't want what are called dead sperm. They're always going to be some in a sample because of the age of the sperm, et cetera, and the way the spermatogenesis cycle go, but you want forwardly motile sperm. The other ones are called twitchers. So, you know, they just twitch in place. They can actually take twitchers and force them into the egg during IVF, something called ICSI. But in general, the, the greater number of forward motile sperm. I'm swimming them toward you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I'm yeah. actually swimming them an angle away from Tim. So forward yeah, exactly. on our first exactly. person <laughs> podcast date. Exactly. Can be greatly increased by supplementation with L-carnitine. So mm-hmm. egg health and sperm health greatly enhanced by L-carnitine. Pretty remarkable yeah. results there. Injectable L-carnitine of about one mil, one mig per day. Okay. Now that has to be prescribed by a doctor. And that's IM? That's intramuscular? Yeah. Or, yeah. yeah. or oral capsules are available over the counter. Then you have to get up to four or five grams per oh, day. Wow. I was going to ask. Yeah. yeah. That's and that higher. can increase TMAO and some other markers that aren't great for cardiovascular health because of the way it's processed by the gut. But you can offset that by taking 600 milligrams of garlic because of the allicin in garlic. Okay. Smoking cigarettes, vaping cigarettes. Really good for sperm. Terrible for sperm, <laughs> terrible for eggs. Smoking cannabis, vaping cannabis, also terrible, eggs and sperm. People don't like to hear that. 15% of women, I can't believe the statistic, but I've seen it over and over and to check my eyes, but 15% ingest cannabis at some point during pregnancy, Mm. 15%, probably not a good idea. Now, a lot of people say, oh, I smoke weed every day and got my wife pregnant. You never know how healthy your children would have been. You never, you just never know. I'm not saying your children are unhealthy, but you never know. There are also going to be, there will always be edge cases where like, I smoke crack every week and never slept for 14 (laughs) days straight. My kids are great. And you're like, okay, just because you happen to be the one mutant. Right. 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 Yeah. If you (laughs) want to optimize for who can thread that needle. Exactly. Doesn't mean you're a good model. Exactly. So L-carnitine can really help avoid smoking anything you know, the issue of tinctures and edibles is a different subject altogether. I think the big wow for me was something, again, I'm just going to tip my hat to you, which is that in 2015, I taught a class at, I was then a professor at UC San Diego on neural circuits and health and disease. And I decided to do a lecture on whether or not cell phones inhibit sperm health and or testosterone level. The data were very mixed, frankly. There were essentially two good studies in rats, each of them taking a standard smartphone, putting it under a rat's cage, and then looking at some metrics related to testicular health, sperm health, et cetera. One showed increases in testosterone, the other showed decreases. So it was was kind of a disappointing situation. So I'd present both. Now there is an extensive meta-analysis. I can send you this for the, for the show notes if you like. An extensive meta-analysis of dozens of studies. I'll add it to the next reprint of the four-hour body. And it very convincingly shows that keeping the cell phone in one's pocket, so this isn't putting it to your head, this isn't putting it on the desk in front of you, but keeping it on and in one's pocket, and it does not matter if it's on Wi-Fi or you're using cellular, decreases 
sperm quality, which means forward motility, number of healthy sperm per ejaculate, et cetera, even ejaculate volume to some extent, and lowers testosterone overall, which is perhaps not surprising given the known heat effects of the phone. So even though it doesn't feel hot to the touch, there are heat effects. Sperm don't like heat. In fact, the most promising male contraceptive that's out there that's not a condom is a it's like a cuff that goes around the vas deferens, which is the portal from the testes to the urethra that allows the ejaculate to leave the body that heats that, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, a sauna will, it's not a great form of contraception because it's not sure proof, but it will reduce your total number of motile sperm by 75% or so. When I go in the sauna, because I do hope to, when I do lot. hope to conceive children somewhere. <laughs> so I wear shorts into the sauna and I actually put a, a cold pack at my groin yeah. while I'm in there. It's actually kind of, when the sun is really hot, it's also, it makes it a little less unpleasant. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little painful, <laughs> but you definitely don't want to do that on bare skin. I'm chuckling too, but heat is part of the problem with the cell phone, but it yeah. turns out, yes, and here people are going to think I'm a like, crazy person, but they might think that already. The EMFs, that business is real. Yeah. Now, is it so real that it's giving us gliomas? Unclear. I'm not going to go there. The data aren't in, but it is very clear that the radiation from phones, the EMFs and the heat are combining to reduce sperm quality, motility, and overall testosterone. So it's a simple thing. Turn off your phone completely, or even better, just don't put it in your front pocket. If you have to put it in a pocket, put it in your back pocket. If you even better would be to put it in a shoulder pocket or a backpack. And I also, I'm a weirdo perhaps, but I don't like keeping the phone to the, my head too long, but that's also because I don't like holding the phone <laughs> to my head too long. We don't know very much about the effects of EMFs and heat effects on the different tissues of the body, but we now know a lot about the effects of heat and EMFs on sperm quality, and it's not a good picture for the sperm. Hmm. Where does airplane mode fit into this equation, if at all, yeah. in terms of between on and off? I mean, does it prevent or mitigate some of the effects it seems to yeah it seems to here's what's really scary about this meta-analysis their conclusion is that the total amount of time spent with the phone in the pocket is not a strong determinant that it's it's not all or none but that the threshold beyond which you start seeing these damaging effects is pretty low Hmm. so you know again here we're talking about a don't not a do and so it's pretty straightforward you know don't keep the phone in your front pocket if you're concerned with sperm health and and testosterone production. Now, why is sperm health and testosterone production so correlated? And you say, well, duh, it's because, you know, testosterone and sperm. But if you're not interested in conceiving children, you might not think this is an issue. But remember that the two types of cells, those Leydig cells and the Sertoli cells of of the testes, combine testosterone and the androgen binding protein to give rise to sperm. So anytime you're seeing a reduction in sperm, you are definitely seeing that as a reflection of reduction in androgen binding protein, which means whatever testosterone you have around is also not having the effect on that local organ Mm -hmm. that it it should. In other words, the testes and the ovaries are very interesting organs because they secrete hormones into the body to go have effects, but they also have effects on themselves Mm -hmm. and it's self-amplify. And so this just seems like such a straightforward one to me. And you said this back in, when was the four hour body published? Came out in 2010. Yeah. Yeah. And I remember you and Paul Quinn and a few other people saying like, don't keep the phone in your pocket. And I remember lecturing to about 400 students about this. And I would say about half just, you know, by my read, about half of the the guys in the class took the phone out of their pocket when they heard this. Mm -hmm. I think young people who aren't thinking about having children at all right now are absolutely the ones that should be most concerned. Yeah. Now it is true. You can, as they told us in high school, it just takes one sperm, but you know, it just takes one sperm, but in order to get that one sperm to the egg in vivo, you know, not IVF, but it's called natural conception. There's a lot of territory that needs to be covered. There's a lot of chemical environments that need to be dealt with. You want the healthiest sperm. So I would say also having gone through this process with an X to create embryos, even though you can say it only takes one sperm in IVF as well, you want to stack the odds in your favor, which means you need good morphology, good motility, and you need a good count mm-hmm. of non-crippled sperm. <laughs> yeah. Sperm analysis can be a humbling thing because, you know, no matter what, no one's getting 100% motile, forwardly motile. Everyone, males and females, learn a lot about their biology, what they're doing well, what they're doing less well. 
when going down that pathway of IVF, I think. Yeah. I think for women, one of the big surprises is that it doesn't take much ingestion of alcohol to diminish egg quality. You know, beyond two or three drinks per week, per week, you really start to see reductions in egg quality that are probably indirect through effects on diminished sleep and changes in stress hormones. And so, you know, again, some people will be more resilient to this than others. People always like to make jokes about how alcohol facilitates the conception process, you know, et cetera. <laughs> you know, I think that in general, you know, if women are having very regular cycles, whether or not they're 28 days long or 35 days long is less important perhaps than they'd be fairly regular. Women in general tend to know more about their bodies and because they cycle than, than men. But I, if I could go back in time to my 30s, I sure sure would have banked sperm then. Yeah. And, you know, I feel good about where I've gotten my parameters, but it's really interesting as you learn this, you, you just realize that freezing sperm, freezing eggs is a great idea. Mm -hmm. And freezing embryos makes sense if you have the appropriate pairing or situation, right? Yeah. And that life gets so much easier for those wishing to conceive when you have healthy embryos frozen in the bank. Yeah. Anyway, for those challenged in that area, it also becomes this like, incredibly expensive, emotionally and financially expensive battle.